A warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining Tenancy Deposit Scheme's latest webinar. Today we are thrilled to be joined by Kate Faulkner, Managing Director of Designs on Property.co.uk and PropertyChecklist.co.uk. I'm really pleased to have Kate join us today as we discuss what tenancy deposit protection means for landlords. For those of you who don't know me by now, my name is Ben Michaelis and I'll be hosting today's webinar. As always, before I hand over to Kate for the presentation and a little later towards our Q&A session, I'd just like to highlight a couple of features that are available in our webinar platform today. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, we're really keen to hear from you. Please use the questions icon on the webinar dashboard. Kate and I will review all the questions towards the end of the presentation and do our best to answer as many as possible. Our webinar platform also allows you to take notes should you wish. Uh, look out for the icon which shows a piece of paper with a pencil on top and it will also allow you to email the notes to yourself should you want to. In the unfortunate event that you do experience any internet or connectivity issues, um, which is always prone with home working nowadays, please do try to refresh uh, the web page in the first instance. If for any reason this doesn't work, please close the webinar um, in, your, in your internet browser and then can click back onto your webinar rem reminder email to uh, completely refresh your connection. Hopefully that will solve any issues that you may encounter. That's everything from me. A warm welcome to anyone that's just joining us this morning. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to Kate Faulkner for the presentation. Kate, over to you. Are you with us, Kate? Are you, uh, uh, yeah, are we working yet? Yeah, we're just checking in now. Fantastic. Looks like we're experiencing some, some technical issues here with connect, Kate connecting. Kate, if you can hear me, uh, just try muting, um, try using the tools on the bottom toolbar and hopefully it'll allow you to unmute yourself and enable your camera. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. Right, okay. There we go. Fantastic. I can hear you, I can hear you but you obviously weren't hearing me. No worries at all. Right. Am I ready for the off? You are good. You are all good to go. Looking okay. forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you're well. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background as to who I am, mostly because um, obviously that's of no real interest to me, but it might be helpful to you in terms of um, asking questions later. So um, I'm really a bit of a generalist when it comes to property. So um, a jack of all trades. Uh, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. So um, whether you've got questions on deposits today or whether you've got questions, one of my specialities is talking about the property market and you're not sure where it's going, um, how politics and economics is affecting the market, or indeed you're just sort of starting out and you've got a few questions um, that you might not might be nervous to ask anybody else. You can you can always ask me those. So um, here to help and uh, over and above talking about tenancy deposit schemes, feel free to um, throw any questions my way and I will do my best to um, help you. So I've done a lot in the past, done a lot, wrote to write all the property books for which, um, done a lot with, used to do uh, LBC Radio's Property Hour. So every Thursday I used to head down to London and uh, have a great time uh, in the studios, uh, basically just answering your people's questions uh, a little bit like uh, we are today. So um, <clears throat> all I ever try and do is give you the right advice, basically, never try and sell you anything so you can be relieved about that. Um, so I'm here today mostly to talk to you about um, tenancy deposits, but um, I do think that we don't, you, you're not actually, if you're listening to the media and hoping that you're going to get good information from them in terms of where the market is going and what's happening in the future, I'm afraid you're not, because a lot of the information and a lot of the headlines that I'm seeing um, are either overblown or, to be honest, totally inaccurate. Um, a lot of property data that is put out is there for PR purposes. The media tend to go for the downside of the news rather than the upside of the news. Um, and as a result of that, it's a little bit difficult, really, to try and get a handle on what's exactly going on. Um, so what I tend to do is look at, well, the if the economy is doing well, property will do well. If the economy does badly, in theory, property will do badly, apart from the last few months. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, I've taken the information uh, that we get from the Office of Budget Responsibility. It's fairly robust. It's independent of government. And basically what this chart does, if you see that yellow line, 
what you have there is this is this is a measure if you like of economic activity and basically what we were hoping for was one two percent economic growth over the next um five years so that yellow line was what we were hoping for pre-covid what you can then see of the three lines underneath there is a happy scenario which says that it'll take us about 18 months and then we'll be back on track there's a medium scenario that says actually it's going to take us about five years to get um, our economy back on track and there's a really bad news scenario in the even in five years time we're not going to um uh, get to where we were planning to be so um it and we don't know and we're probably being realistic with the data that comes out and with everything that's happening we're not really going to know till january next year i think exactly how everything's going to pan out because furlough will end in october that's big fears that everybody has of how that will affect um the economy and the main reason for that is that um this will We'll either kind of live or die, if you like, by um, the level of unemployment. So that's the nervousness. And you can see on here on this slide. So again, the yellow line said 4%. Um, and to give you a bit of an idea, we're probably up to about 7 or 8% for those of you that lived through the last recession. And even the best case scenario is that we're going to hit 10%. Um, so that is not great news. And the worst case scenario is that we could even be heading up to about 13%. So this is the real kind of unknown and conundrum at the moment. We don't know how bad it is going to get, but even the best case scenario says it's going to be worse uh, unemployment wise. The difference is that in the last recession, kind of everybody uh, it, you people were unemployed, seven or eight percent people were unemployed, and then the whole of the economy came down, so people stopped spending less. Whereas in this case, what we're looking at is probably higher unemployment, but there's also a lot of people that have done very well out of this. So retailers, for example, obviously the NHS are doing overtime uh, less than um, and working as hard as they can. So we've never this is a very unique scenario. We've never had one section of society doing incredibly well and one section of society doing incredibly badly. We've just kind of had everybody not doing so well um, in re previous recessions. So we don't know how it will pan out um, in terms of how that relates to property. Um, Basically, this is um, this is a report from Savills, but I'm going to give you a happier picture at this moment in time. Savills do five year uh, forecasts of what's going to happen with house prices. And if you're into a landlord or buy to let, actually, it's really important to um, know first. If you look at the last two columns, so if we take UK back in November, over the next five years, Savills were predicting a 15 percent rise. That's that's actually quite low. Normally, you'd expect to see that 25, 30 percent. So capital growth, we know, is definitely slowing. And their prediction of around 15 percent growth over the next five years, I think, was pretty uh, accurate. Now, the interesting thing is post COVID, they are actually predicting pretty much the same rises. It's just that the next five years are going to feel a little different um, in their predictions. So you can see down there, if you're in the East Midlands, where I am, that it was 18 percent pre-COVID before we'd heard about it even because uh, these came out in November. And then post-COVID, um, they're talking about exactly the same amount, so around the 18 percent mark. So long term, we're not expecting it to um uh, affect house prices, but they are in the short term. Now, Savills came out with this forecast very, very early on. And to be fair to them, it was a pretty difficult job um, to try and understand sort of May, June time, what on earth was going to happen. So everybody really expected at that time, because remember, the market wasn't really open, um, that the biggest impact of COVID on the property market would be this year. Um, and then over subsequent years, it would recover. It looks like the government have very successfully pushed that back. The market is unbelievably busy at the moment. And uh, Home Track have got a really good report out if you want to find out more. And rather than predicting declines this year, they're actually saying prices will be up by two or three percent. And that is actually backed up by the latest data that we're getting from people like Rightmove and people like the mortgage lenders as well. So it does look that. Um, the property market will do OK this year, but it has to hit sometime. All we're doing at this moment and the reason for the um, sort of supply and demand uh, mix going in favour of sellers is purely because uh, the people we're pulling a lot of sales forward. Stamp duty has exaggerated that. The stories I'm hearing are people looking at moving five years time. They're looking to move now because if you're buying a 
£500,000 house and can save 15 grand, well, you're going to see if you can shift now, aren't you? Because uh, better than paying that to the government in tax, I expect you're all thinking. Um, so as important, obviously, from a house price perspective, uh, is what happens to rents. Now, I'll explain this from the bottom up. And again, this is Savills. So what you can see at the bottom is their predictions for income growth. Um, so they're expecting incomes, no surprise, to fall this year. Although, again, some people will see falls. Some people will actually be better off this year, surprisingly. And then they're looking at rises for the next few years. From 2022 onwards, that's pretty much in line with the rises that they thought. And the five year, just like with house prices, the five year forecasts are expected to be exactly the same as they were um, on house prices. So they're not predict again, long term, predicting that rents will be um, uh, where they were supposed to be before COVID hit. Now, uh, what we are looking at is a, perhaps um, a bigger fall in the rest of the UK, but I'm certainly picking up that London is getting hit um, this year. So you might want to tell me about that afterwards. And then they're predicting that that fall in rents this year will come will bounce back next year. I'm not so sure on that, if I'm very honest. And this is the reason why. So that income growth figure at the bottom, we know that you, the rent that you get as a landlord is purely dependent on the wages of the people that are renting your property. They go up ahead of inflation, you can raise rents. If they don't or they fall, you can't raise rents. So one of the things that I would say is really important is when you're thinking about taking new tenants on over the next 12 months is the first question I'd be asking myself, has this person got an occupation um, that is going to survive um, the next 12, 18 months or even five years if we does get protracted? Or indeed, um, of course, it might well mean that actually people on universal credit are a great idea because they've had a thousand pound wage increase over the next 12 months. And they've also had their local housing allowance up. And in some cases, that's meant an extra 250 pounds to spend um, every single month on their rent. So because uh, they were sort of kept so low. So um, the good news is five year picture is pretty much the same. And I think they're about right on that. But we're going to have a few wobbles in between whilst you might see that as an opportunity or not. Um, and if you're worried about anything, kind of let me know. So that kind of walks you through where I kind of think the market's at and more than happy to uh, answer any of your questions um, from here on in. So one of the things we are talking about today, though, is why on earth do you need to secure a tenancy deposit? Now, I don't know if you're kind of new to this or if you've been doing it for years and you could probably teach me a thing or two. Um, but for me, it is the right thing to take a tenancy deposit um, where you can. So one of the things that um, I would say is there are now um, uh, three types of tenancy deposits. And there's a lot of discussion. Uh, excuse me, just bringing up notes here. There's a lot of discussion about which are the right ones to use. And to be honest, that really depends on you. Uh, and what you're comfortable with. So the three that are available is you have a custodial deposit, and that means that you get the money from the tenant and you hand it over to somebody like the TDS, for example. They hang on to it. It's nice and safe in their hands so the tenant can feel assured. You don't have to worry about the administration of it. That's all done by the TDS. And that is free. And the reason it's free, obviously, if TDS is sitting on that money, it can be invested. So um, that's where that works. The other one is uh, the insured scheme, and you do have to pay that. So you get to hang on to the deposit, but if anything happens, uh, the tenant is assured that you'll get that back. That does cost you a little bit of money. Um, and depending on whether you're a member of the National uh, Residential Landlord Association or not, it'll cost you anything from about £13 to £24, depending on how much you protect. So it's not huge amounts. Don't forget that's all tax deductible as well. Um, the third choice you do have these days, and I don't think they've taken off perhaps as much as people thought, is the no deposit option. Um, some agents are doing this. Um, there's about three companies that look at doing this. And that's whereby the tenant sort of pays, a bit like you pay on insurance when you don't hand over the deposit to TDS. The tenant pays, the, pays an insurance, basically, that says to you, the landlord, look, I've paid this insurance, so... Um, I, I kind of I've, I don't need to give you a deposit because the company that I've paid it to will put everything right that I mess up. The only difficulty thing that I would highlight with this is a lot of tenants don't realise they are still liable 
um, for the damage that's done. So those insurance companies will take the tenants' money and then will chase them for the repairs um, that they have to pay out to you as well. So in theory, it's better for you as a landlord because you you get your uh, you get your money. But on the other hand, um, it's whether it's right for tenants or not. It's slightly cheaper for them from a cash flow perspective in the short term, but obviously in the longer term, they're not going to get their money back. So it's up to you which one you choose. Um, and which one you kind of feel uh, comfortable with. Um, and if you've had a scheme going for a long time, if you're not sure how much rent to take or how much deposit to take, you can only take a maximum of five weeks now. It used to be on average about six and that got reduced down. And there's a really useful little calculator if you go to TBS um, at the front. So um, I hope that's just a bit of helpful background. Um, so for me, um, the, re the first reason is when you take a deposit, what you've got to bear in mind is you've got to protect it in one of the three uh, license schemes. Um, so you've got things like the TDS um, and there are other, other schemes available, as I think they say on the BBC. Um, and the other thing you need to know, and I think we often forget as landlords, what we tend to do is we tend to just go ahead and do all these things that we're told to do. But we forget to tell the tenants how much we're looking after them. So you get a dodgy landlord, they'll take their money, they'll probably find lots of reasons why they won't get that deposit back afterwards. So what's really important is when you do take a deposit and you do protect it in one of the schemes that is available, it's really important to make sure your tenants understand that. And I know recently someone had come up and um, they were switching their, obviously switching their tenancy deposit scheme. What they'd done was they'd done the admin really well, but what they'd not done was explain to the tenant why they take the deposit and why they were having to do this extra paperwork. And they weren't explaining to them that this was really, really good and they were being a good landlord. So with the mistrust that's put out, because, of course, all landlords and letting agents, according to people outside of our world, are evil. Um, so they really were didn't trust what was going on and they were nervous. Um, and there was, if somebody bothered to explain to them why, um, they didn't have to worry. And that actually, this was all signs that they were being a good landlord, which was what I was able to tell them. Uh, that was really, really useful. Um, the second thing I think uh, uh, is that it does give you protection against damage against your property. Um, I've been looking at some of the reasons why um, people have disputes occur. And normally um, the two things are property not being cleaned properly. Um, and let's face it, uh, your view on what what clean looks like versus a tenant's view could be completely different. I have to say some tenants uh, I've seen have a much better idea of what cleaning is than I have um, and some vice versa. So there is a little bit of um, grayness in that. But of course, that's where you rely on an inventory. And what I would say to you is if you're running the deposit scheme, please, please make sure you have an inventory done. It's a real false economy not to do that, because if there is problems with cleaning, if there is damage issues, you it's on you your shoulders as a landlord to show people, uh, to show the independent uh, guys that uh, what it was like beforehand and what it looks like now. And they're very reliant on pictures, typically, uh, and the write-ups that are given. If you're somebody that's quite detailed um, and uh, people get quite irritated with you because you like to note everything down, you'll probably be able to do an inventory yourself. However, if you're somebody like me that tends to uh, not be that detailed um, and not a fan of cleaning either, really, um, then you might want to just, I would certainly, for me, it would be something I would outsource to somebody that was uh, had the skill set to do it, which I certainly don't. Um, and what I would say is we get, landlords tend to get a lot of flack just for being landlords. But one of the things that does irritate me, if you think about, and you might want to have a look at these figures locally, but when we rent a car, um, you have to put a deposit down. Um, that tends to be quite hefty. It goes on your credit card, etc. And then you get that money back at the end. Well, Considering that on average, you're probably renting to people a hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand pound property to only be taking somewhere between sort of five hundred to a thousand pound deposit. That's not much considering the amount of damage that people can cause to a property. And of course, you're the one, unlike when somebody rents a car based on their own insurance, you're the one that actually has to pay to insure it as well. So it's going to come back to bite you in some way, shape or form. Um, so most of the stuff that the tenants do, of course, is accidental. Uh, others, it might be on purpose. Um, I remember going to buy a, um, oh, I went, somebody said, to you, would you, can you come and have a look at this property? It's a repossession. Um, just to warn you, 
uh, they said the um, the person repossessed wasn't very happy. Um, so when you go and visit the property, there is an engine with all the oil uh, on the carpet um, in the middle of the living room. Um, and that's what they kindly left us, uh, plus quite a lot of other rubbish. And for some reason, the lender decided not even bother to clear it out. So, um, you know, it does happen. But fortunately, it's mostly they've done it by accident. They've lived with it for a little while and they've just forgotten to sort it. Um, so it does happen. And if you don't have a deposit, it's going to be difficult for you to claim that money back. And it can add up. Um, so there is good reason from that perspective um, to take a deposit. The next one is that for me, um, it's really interesting. I did quite a lot. I did a report actually for the TDS on an uh, exciting topic, uh, and it was actually quite exciting if you, if you like this kind of thing, on damp and mould. And one of the problems that we came across in quite a few case studies was that the people that were uh, one, of the, one of the reasons the property was, was becoming full of damp and mould was because the tenant actually couldn't afford to heat the property. And so I do think it's prudent. If somebody can't pay the, month, the, the rent up front, they don't have to pay letting fees anymore or fees to you, um, nor have they got a spare bit of cash in their back pocket to put forward for a deposit. My worry is, is then, well, can they heat that? What if, as we've seen with COVID, something goes wrong and they don't get their work for the next couple of weeks? That really is, if you're going to rent something from a landlord, you've got to have the responsibility of making sure, just like we all have, and perhaps all learned that lesson over the last few months, that we've all got to have a bit of spare cash in the bank because actually not everybody's going to bail us out. So from that perspective, um, I do think it is quite important that you know that your tenant is, finances are robust enough to be able to um, uh, give a, a deposit. So um, I think that is, a, uh, for me, that's, it just makes it very prudent, apart from the fact you can kind of uh, collect things afterwards. Has that just jumped on? Because we seem to have gone from three to, three to, I'm sure there's four and five somewhere here. Let's have a little look. Don't you just love technology? No? Ben, I don't know if you can help me out here. I seem to be missing some of my slides. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's just after your next slide. If you just, the, the next slide is just a prompt for anyone listening. If you do want to ask Kate any questions and you do have any based on the initial slide um, that, that Kate has covered, if you do want to ask any using the questions tab on the left-hand side of your screen, if you're on a desktop, um, just start to ask them and we'll, we'll process them towards the end of it. Uh, let's move on and hopefully reasons four and five are the next couple. Yeah. And now for everybody uh, who is listening um, on the other end still, um, Ben did tell me that. Uh, so I've completely forgotten. So thank you for filling in, Ben. That's much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. All right. Happy bunnies. Uh, right. We're up to reason four now. The big thing for me is that people get very, very emotive about the money. And there's a lot of I spend a lot of my time doing uh, social media work. And particularly I found Facebook's quite interesting place to go and sort of sense how people deal with letting issues, both from a tenant's perspective and from a landlord's perspective. And um, the thing that really surprises me, and I remember um, this with um, LBC when I was doing the property hour every Thursday, we got huge numbers of phone calls with people saying, oh, my landlords, my, my daughter. And it was often the parents, by the way. So it's worth knowing um, and having access to parents if you can, uh, particularly if they're guarantors or anything. Then um, they'd ring up, they go, well, um, my daughter's just left or my son's just left and uh, they haven't had their deposit back. And you go, well, how long is it? Well, it's two months. And I'm going, OK, well, do you know if it was protected? That's the first thing to look at. I said, yes, it was protected in the so-and-so scheme. And I go, have you been in touch with them? And they go, uh, no. And I kind of said, well, that's what they're there for. So what had been happening was both the landlord and the sort of parents and that were getting really angst and worried about this situation with the deposit. Um, and all that actually needed to be done was for the landlord to tell the parents and, and the daughters, say, look, don't worry about it. I'm a good landlord. And I can show you that I'm a good landlord because I've protected your deposit in one of the government schemes case is now with them to sort out so if you've got any worries or fears 
I'm not the person to come to because I can't hand you back a deposit. It's got to go through the tenancy deposit scheme. So what it does is it just takes a weight off your shoulders. And if you're doing the custodial scheme, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, so I'll just check that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it does. It doesn't cost you something. And somebody else takes on what is always a really emotive situation. And you can say, look, it's not down to me. I'm a good landlord. I've protected it in here. So just have a chat to them. So it just takes off, you know, and if you're in the middle of your holiday, which you might be just now, although I'd, I'd hope you'd have better things to do than listen to me if you were on holiday. So it does take away a lot of stress and hassle because deposits are incredibly emotive. Um, so it's definitely worth it from uh, that perspective. And the other side of it, of course, is you can't do this. You can't claim on your deposit until the end of the tenancy. But if the end of the tenancy has arrived and you are owed rent, um, then uh, what some people do, and it, it, this goes back to what I would call the old days, um, for want of a better phrase, in the, in the old days when landlords and tenants uh, were allowed to trust each other, um, what used to happen was uh, rather than pay back the deposit, the landlord used to put him, used to hand back, um, uh, used to allow the tenants to be let off the last rent arrears, the last month's rent. That enabled the tenant to then take to have that as a deposit to put on the next property. Um, and the reason that all got stopped was particularly shelter campaign very hard to say that all you evil landlords and letting agents, you weren't stopping, you were stopping people having uh, deposits back. And I think at the time they were saying it was something like this was happening 20% of the time. When the schemes were set up, and it might be that the schemes did make a massive difference, actually, it's very, very rare for, um, uh, for, that not to, for that to be the situation and not to happen because the number of claims that were going through were like less than 2%. So it wasn't quite um, as, as big an issue. Um, and I can't believe it would have switched off overnight, but that's that's so that's where we are. Um, so the idea, and of course, it is difficult for tenants because what has happened is the change on the one hand protects them more, but on the other hand, it does mean that they've got a deposit sitting with you, which might be five hundred thousand pounds or more, and then if they're moving on to another rental property, they've then got to find another five hundred thousand pounds plus pay you your rent plus pay the next person extra rent as well. So that cash flow at the end um, is quite um, quite good, um, but it does mean that from your perspective, you have a little bit, if somebody hasn't paid the rent or doesn't pay that last month, um, then you've got a little bit of recourse uh, to be able to um, look after yourself. So um, I hope that's useful. Um, I personally think deposits are a good idea, um, as you might tell. Uh, and I think now I hand back to Ben for a little bit, who's going to sort out a snap poll. Is that right, Ben? That is absolutely the case. We can do that. So um, just uh, want to get a bit of uh, audience participation in this webinar this morning. So we have a, a snap poll, which I'm just about to share with everybody, which should have appeared on your screens now. What's your biggest frustration with tenancy deposit protection? So we've got four different answers there. It'd be really great to hear everyone's honest views on what they feel is the most um, you know, frustrating part of the process. Uh, and it's always good from a, from a TDS perspective to understand because then we can refine things and produce more content accordingly moving forward. Put a bit of a split vote so far. have a look I shall end it shortly you have one slight winner so I'm going to share the results there so oh we've got we've had a few more moving and let me share the results so we have uh, form filling in and signing admin uh, administrative processes seems to be one of the biggest frustrations for people today um and second to that is deposit disputes which i know you're going to come on to at some point a bit later kate as well that'd be quite interesting to to work out uh, what everyone's views are on that uh, back over to you okie dokie so um having had the stat poll having talked about the difference with deposits um i did think it was useful um just to remind you of the stamp duty changes that we have going so um 
This is for England, by the way. I'll walk you through uh, what's happening elsewhere because it gets very complicated. If you don't know, each country in the UK, so England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, they can now set all of their own policies when it comes to housing. Um, and uh, the, one of the results of that is that England and Northern Ireland stamp duty are the same, but Wales and Scotland have a different stamp duty system. So in England, uh, it was announced a few um, weeks ago that you don't have to pay any stamp duty now up to half a million. The way it worked before was if you bought a property uh, for over £125,000 and it was your only property, you would pay uh, a different rate. So you'd pay around 2% up to 250 um, and you'd only pay that rate based on the amount of money. So it used to be what they call a slab tax and it then moved to a more progressive one. So you paid stamp duty based on the 125,000 part of the 250 because the first 125 was free for everybody. Um, and so for a £250,000 house, you'd be paying a stamp duty of around two and a half grand. Uh, now, you can save up to £15,000, as mentioned before, for up to half a million. And then everybody that buys over that still saves that £15,000. If you're a multiple property owner, it's exactly the same. The only difference is that you are, you should be aware that you have to pay an additional tax if on the day of completion you own two properties. There are some cases where you can claim that back and I can explain that later if that's a question. So instead of paying, for example, up to £500,000, you would pay the 3%, which is the additional, whereas normally uh, you would have paid 2% between 125 and 250, and then you would have paid 5% between 250 and 500. So um, you do still save uh, quite a substantial amount um, as you go up, but you obviously have to pay the additional um, stamp duty rate, I'm afraid. So um, that's, that's still there and that hasn't uh, changed. Um, so I think, Ben, it's over to questions now. It is. Thank you very much. Uh, just a last call to everybody. If you're, um, you know, you've been interested by some of the things that Kate has explained this morning and you have any questions uh, regarding uh, those points, please just feel free to use the questions tab, ask us some questions. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with a few that uh, we've had in already, Kate. So um, first question, uh, what are your top tips for landlords in today's market? Because obviously with the current pandemic, the situation that's evolving and changing quite rapidly, uh, does you know is your advice now changing based on the pandemic or is the approach the same? But obviously we just have to be more cautious because of the scenario. What's your view? Yeah, so there's kind of two parts, I think, to being a landlord during the current circumstances. And the first bit, it's it's incredibly boring, um, but um, I did work on uh, very hard with the rest of the industry on producing guidelines for how to make sure that we as an industry, and that very much includes landlords, particularly self-managing landlords, how we move people safely. So uh, I've got a free website, which is called propertychecklist.co.uk. And if you go on there, you will see that there are three checklists. And we had these ready for um, uh, the day when the market opened on the 13th of May. And they explain what to do before you book an appointment with somebody. So if somebody is coming to one of your properties, particularly, I would say, if it's an HMO, we also have a separate uh, uh, suggestions on HMOs because the government didn't um, issue anything specific. Uh, but the two things to remember with COVID are it spreads via, you know, if we were sitting together and you were sort of right in front of me, then uh, one of us had COVID, we'd probably catch it if we carried on chatting for a little while. Um, so you want to avoid that sort of space. And that's where that two metre distance comes from. And now I know that's kind of we have the one metre plus, but in property, we're sticking to you should always stick where possible to the two metre distance. Obviously, it requires a room of more than two metres. Um, and um, uh, so we recommend that when you go, when you or a tenant, a prospective tenant is going into a property, um, we recommend obviously you both hand sanitise before you go in, but you should get there early. And one of the best things you can do is to open up all of the windows. Um, because that means that, you're, that the amount of COVID that can spread is less because you're allowing airflow into the building. So 
it's I don't think it's been adopted as much as it should do. But if you are showing properties, you should be opening as many windows as possible and doors and keeping doors open where you can. The second thing you should have done uh, as you're doing going around opening everything is to make sure that um, you use antiseptic wipes or however you want to clean to make sure that all the door handles, switches, all the things that people um, tend to. Uh, use or, or touch because the other way you've got the air flowing and then it is touch so hopefully if everybody's hand sanitized before you go in you should be fairly safe but um some people will blow their nose or have a cough or whatever it might be or sneeze as they go around and then of course we're back to square one so um really important to um hand sanitize on the way in and also hand sanitize on the way out and as a landlord if you're showing a property particularly again if it's an hmo make sure any surfaces that the, the prospective tenant touched um, has been cleaned afterwards. So um, it's things like that that are really important. And with the update on um, uh, Friday, when you have to wear a mask into shops, when you, if you're going into an agent at all, firstly, you have to book an appointment with them. But secondly, you as a consumer in that case, either the tenant or yourself, you will have to wear a mask. They don't necessarily have to wear a mask in um, as staff in the office. So it's decided as one, one of you is doing that should be fine. And we are also saying now, so we're updating, middle of updating the guidance. If you are doing viewings with tenants, you both should be doing, you both should be wearing masks to protect everybody. So really, really important to be aware of those changes and that, the kind of things that we're used to doing. And again, if you've got an inventory clerk going in, if you've got, I don't know that the trades have been particularly well briefed on this. So if you've got a gas guy going in, electrics guy, a handyman, make sure they are sticking to the rules because they should also be wearing masks where possible. Uh, not everybody can do it, but absolutely thing. And we, we must do what we can because if we don't do as landlords um, what we can to spread the virus and as tenants, then we're going to get shut down. And at the moment, um, we're being fairly lucky in that although we were part of the initial lockdown, um, since the market as a home moving market and construction market has been open, um, the government, when it comes to local lockdowns, hasn't designated um, home moving as something that can't be done. So we can carry on um, during these localised lockdowns when we were stopped and doing it nationally. So, um, and we're very privileged to be able to do that, but we've got to make sure that we protect everybody, including yourselves and your family and everybody you know, et cetera, and your friends. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is it is so difficult to keep up with the new rules. So you may be aware that the courts are opening on the 23rd of August. The new rules basically and the Q&As that the government did, which were actually very, very high quality, there were, there were 21 pages of A4 on how to manage a let during COVID. 21 pages of A4. Mm. Now, if you've got a full time job, that's very difficult to keep up with. Um, so uh, and now we've got the 23rd of August, you've got new possession laws. So there are certain things that you will have to do if you have uh, sent out a notice. And of course, you can't evict somebody for three months, not the original two. Um, so uh, those will be coming up though on the August 23rd. Um, the first cases that they will hear will be ones that were stopped during lockdown and then they'll get round to doing yours. So you've got to be prepared for a few months on top of that. And the recommendation is really that you try and mediate um, with the tenant if you can. Um, and there are some mediation services out there if you're struggling to do that yourself. So you've got to be as a landlord now absolutely on the ball. You cannot ignore um, the government guidelines and the changes to government guidelines, which say you only had uh, some out last week. You've got to be on the ball with those things and you must, must implement those. Please, please do that. Please look after yourself, uh, your tenants and family and friends. Um, and then the second thing is to keep up with the new rules and to understand how that's going to impact your business. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that in the past, people haven't been so keen to take people on universal credit. I know that landlords are being absolutely bashed and accused of discrimination, all sorts of things. I have fought that because I think that's totally unfair. And I'm really sorry that you've been bashed in that way. Um, but because I know the real reason behind it is that it's not the people on benefits that's the problem, it's the benefit system. And it is a fact that you are more likely to have ended up in rent arrears with somebody on universal credit than a private tenant. However, 
from October onwards with um, the furlough scheme coming off, I think you're probably private tenants and universal credit are probably of an equal risk now as a tenant. And you may actually be better off with a universal credit person who you know exactly what's going to happen to them in the future. You do have to check with your insurance company and mortgage lender because although the shelter say there's absolutely no problems and everything's fine, there are still problems. So you've got to check that they're doing that. So you've really got to um, see this as a full time job, I'm afraid, Ben, to, to try and keep up with everything. So those are kind of the main tips. And then make sure you've got a strategy to her to that over the next couple of years if things go pear-shaped your loan to values on any mortgages aren't going to cause any problems so ideally you want sort of 75 percent or less if you can um and um so you want to make sure financially you're okay and that you have some uh backup money and some cash um just in case you need it in if case your tenants aren't going to pay the rent because you're going to really struggle to um to get them out unless they they are happy to leave, um, which of course isn't isn't very nice for anybody if they've just been taken off furlough and lost their job. No, absolutely. Thank you for that, Kate. And I think um, you know, some of your points you raised around uh, mediation and resolution is very topical right now because of the court situation. Um, TDS uh, recently launched TDS resolution to try and bridge that gap and trying to reduce the you know the need for further action and trying to help the rent arrear situation and th like you said earlier in your in your presentation communication is critical for the mediation process and just talking it can have such a big bearing. Um, let's move on to another question uh, we've had. So, how do you think COVID is affecting the uh, the letting of a property now? Um, you know, from my side, I see a lot of optimism in the sector right now because of perhaps there was pent up demand and everybody's now looking, you know, excited to move. What's your view on it? How do you see it? Well, um, all I can do, and all, all, it's such an uncertain time, but actually, if you look at the, we headed into the last recession in 2007-8 uh, when it started to kick in um, with 12.7% of households being in the rental sector. Um, from 2008 to 2009, two things happened. Um, firstly, uh, the letting agents um, had never seen so many properties walk through their door because what happened was people, it's the first time really people recognised we had an established rental market that um, if you owned a property and couldn't sell it, but you still needed to move, all you needed to do was to rent it out. And it actually created, uh, because you didn't have many of them before, it's created a massive rental market in, in houses as opposed to, in three or four bed houses, five bed houses, as opposed to the traditional flats and sort of two bed um, terraces. So the rent, so the, the recession has driven um, the rental market from 12.7% of households to 20%, to zero. Um, so, again, you'll often be accused of being these evil landlords who have um, crowded out first time buyers. Well, the first time buyers up until 2013, about 50 percent of them understandably left the market because it was very difficult to get a mortgage. And if you're a first time buyer, why on earth would you want to buy a property when you're waking up to bad news every day and the property market crashing around your ears? Because property went down by about 20 percent and um, the rents actually initially fell by around five to 20%, depending on where you were. So 5% in uh, London, and I think we'll probably see that again. Um, they actually fell by about 20% in Nottingham. I'm not sure they'll fall that much this time around. Um, and rents go up in tiny in comparison to house prices. So you're normally around 2% a year. So I think you will see some, potentially we'll see some falls. Um, and it's definitely wise just to make sure you rent out that property if it's if everybody else is charging five seven five, go five fifty uh, offers over, um, and that's always what I do. Offers over is a great way of marketing a property and getting people's interest, and hopefully get two people who'll bid it up. That's basically how you get the best rent or the best price. So um, I think that you will see a very buoyant rental market moving forward. I don't think you'll see prices fall as much as you do. That this might be my big Michael Fish moment for those of you that are into your weather. Um, when he said there wasn't a storm and this massive hurricane came and swept the land the next day. But we have logical reasons for not expecting prices to fall as much as they have in the past. Um, and in actual fact, I think on the price front, it will be very individual. So I think some prices won't fall at all because 
you get so few properties coming onto the market. And as I said before, lots of people in good jobs, uh, still earning lots of money, will continue to compete for those. Let's not forget over, I think, 30% of sales now are cash buyers. Over 50% of people own their homes outright. So interestingly, the number of people on mortgages is around 25% of households. And if you think then tenants are about 20%, I'm expecting lettings probably to go up to about 25%. Um, during during the COVID period. So you're in a great market. Um, it did very, very well. Uh, renting did very well. You might lose a bit of rent, but you certainly should, um, uh, hopefully, if, if you find those good tenants, and going back to what I said earlier, check their job and make sure they're in a job that's going to survive for the next sort of five years. So you're talking retail, you're talking uh, people in um, the health service, public services, um, and of course, universe, people on universal credit, much, much more attractive. Um, and, uh, and often will stay longer as well. So if they find a nice property, they'll usually look after it and they will stay longer. It doesn't happen anywhere. I know that I get a lot of grief when I say that, but actually they, they can be the best tenants you've ever had. Super, thank you for that. Uh, hopefully that clears that one up. Now I'm going to move on to a few more tenancy deposit focus questions. We've got a question in from Anthony who asks, in the unlikely event that your company goes bankrupt, what would be your suggestions? Uh, so what happens about the deposit held? What would, what, would, what would your advice be about trying to deal with that scenario? So if you have a company and it goes bankrupt in you know, perhaps because of the pandemic, for example, well, um, and obviously we're relating this to tenancy deposit protection, what happens yeah. about the deposit well, how, how would you answer? I would assume that if you so on a on a no deposit scheme, then um, uh, that that then the tenant's not paying anything over, so that's safe. I'm uh, just going yeah. through each of the different options. So if it's insured, you would have kept the rent, but in actual fact, the insurance that you would have paid, which is that thirteen pounds twenty four, so not a lot of money, um, then the tenant gets their money back. Um, yeah. And on the custodial side, then the tenant, the deposit will be sitting with um, TDS. So yeah, exactly. one one thing that's really good about the system, and one thing that even if you don't, I think when you when you're an HMO, you don't necessarily have to protect the deposit, but you should protect the deposit because actually it's a really sensible system. And when things do go wrong, it's actually very very good at sorting sorting it out. And I think I had a little look. Um, takes on average. Uh, I know we hear, we only hear about, uh, I always get frustrated that we seem to spend most of our time talking about 5% of problems, not the 95% of good things and wonderful landlords and wonderful tenants that are out there every day and agents, etc. We focus on this 5%. But so all we hear about is tenancy deposit cases that took a while, but actually most of the deposits are returned between 11 and 15 days, um, which mm. isn't bad, really. Um, so uh, I'm sorry if you haven't had that wonderful experience of the average, but um uh, that's always the way of the world, I'm afraid. No, I agree. And, and and that brings us quite nicely onto the next question. So from your experience, obviously, you mentioned earlier about looking into uh, the different case studies about mould and things like that. So what would you say are some of the main reasons for disputes and how landlords, uh, landlords avoid them? So, you know, obviously, yeah. there's there's lots of evidence and lots of things out there. What's your view? What are the sort of main sort of plus points to, to stay on side when you're thinking about this? So to not end up with a dispute, what the tenant needs to do is hand that property back to you um, in the condition that you've handed it to them. And that's where the inventory is absolutely critical with lots and lots of photos, uh, noting down and being really careful at the start. So if there was a stain on the carpet when the tenant goes in, that's clearly marked. Um, and if there's other stains that appeared, it's very obvious from a photograph that those other stains have appeared. And I think that um, uh, I work with some very good letting agents and what the really good letting agents do, and it's quite a, a, quite a, a sensible idea, it comes back to communication we were chatting about earlier, is that they go into the uh, property and almost and kind of do a part period periodic inspection just to make sure everything's all right but they actually give the tenant a list of things that they need to check um, to make sure that there isn't a dispute at the end the next thing that they do is on the day of checkout they get the landlord and tenant if they can um, and obviously it's more difficult in this scenario to actually be in the property and to go round it together with the inventory and agree everything there and then. So where that's possible, great. Obviously, it's not the best of markets to be able to do that in. Um, but the tenant, of course, the one thing uh, I thought which was great and 
Um, I have to say, Tenancy Deposit Scheme uh, has got a really good um, Q and A um, help thing for uh, for COVID because it's it's thrown up about another fifty questions, yeah. and they asked it as pre-tenancy questions, during the tenancy, and post-tenancy questions. They're really really worth a little read, or if you're stuck and don't know what to do, have a little look at those. So cleaning and damage are the majority of reasons why there is a dispute. And the best way to make sure that doesn't happen is to really clearly communicate with the tenant what's expected of them um, when they leave the property and how that property should be left. And if you can do that, um, the likelihood of you having any problems. I mean, as I say, I do work with some really good letting agents and the chances of them either one having an eviction uh, they're almost like, wow, look, we've got an eviction. We, we don't normally have any of these. So um, one of the companies work with Belvoir. I run their index for them. And I think it's something like 70% of their offices, and they've got hundreds of them, never have a, an eviction in a quarter. And they're looking after tens of thousands. And they also, when I'm working with them, they very, very rarely have any disputes either. And that's because they are really, really good at communication. So um, I think where landlords and where landlords do self-manage and that they haven't, and it might be either side of this problem, they don't have this really good communication. That's when disputes occur. But if massive agents can run tens of thousands of tenancies without hardly ever having a dispute, that kind of it just shows you that actually it's not necessary if you have the right processes in place. Thank you for that, Kate. Um, last question we're going to come to very briefly. Obviously, uh, you've you've been through a couple of times the different choices that landlords have in terms of deposit schemes. Uh, we, you know, from from your experience, which one do you think has worked well for you in the past? In short or custodial, do you see, um, you know, do you see things going either way, or do you think one's easier than the other to use? Have you got any preference from your experience? I think it's really. Um, I think it comes down to what what make what helps you. And some, another letting agent said to this to me. He says, "What I do," he said, "is I get everybody. I make sure everybody let to gives me their property to let sleeps at night." Mm -hmm. um, so I am fastidious. For example, about um, I'm terrified that a, a, a tenant that, that property I've had in the past, for example, might have a fire. So I am absolutely. Uh, all my smoke alarms are in there every piece of fire equipment I can put in there and whether I need um, uh, a CO2 uh, alarm or not, I stick one in. Do you know what? It costs 15 quid or something. And if that saves somebody's life, then that's kind of really important. So, and I apply the same to the tenancy deposit schemes. Which of those schemes is going to mean that you just don't have to worry about it? So the one for me not being an admin person, bearing in mind, is to hand it all over to the tenancy deposit scheme and let them get on with it. I don't want to be responsible for tenants' um, deposits and that. If I don't have to, if I can hand it off to somebody else and it doesn't cost me anything, it's a bit of a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. But other people are much prefer to have that control. They much prefer to have the deposit themselves, etc. And that's absolutely fine. If that's what makes you sleep at night, go for um uh, the insured scheme, which which it's what it's what helps you uh, basically, and what suits you and your skill set. Absolutely, thank you for that. I really appreciate you going through the Q and A. We'll be able to just knock it on one slide forward. That would be super. Okay, I think I'm getting good at this now. So just just to reiterate to anyone, just to reiterate to anyone listening. Oh, oh. What's going on? Star Trek. Oh, the, the, the wonders of home working. Um, <laughs> so just to, just to everyone listening, obviously we've we've been through it a, a several times now, but obviously um, we have uh, TDS Custodial, which is obviously a free scheme for landlords to join, and they can do so by, by clicking the link. Um, and then obviously we've got TDS uh, Insured, which is obviously a paid-for scheme, but it is an insured back process. Um, so you obviously have a choice as a landlord, and like you said, Kate, a number of times, it's also nice to have the choice, whatever makes you sleep at night, and you can choose. So just to reiterate those to everybody, uh, if we could move on one slide. Um, yeah, thank you. So I just want, to, just want to say thank you so much to Kate for joining us today, and thank you to you okay. also for uh, for joining us. We, uh, we really appreciate you being able to give up the time and listen. Um, the webinar recording will be made available in due course as well, which is super. Um, and uh, we will we'll share that as soon as we have a, a copy of it. 
Um, we do have a one question feedback poll at the end of the session. So if you are able to uh, complete that, it'd be much appreciated because it will help us to improve our content moving forward. All that's left for me to say really is thank you to Kate and thank you to you for joining us. We look forward to welcoming you on another TDS webinar very, very soon. Thanks for your time. Speak to you hey, soon. Hey, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.